Welcome back to the show, everyone. Uh, today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast, well, he is very familiar to you by now. He's uh, the guy who kind of keeps us up to date on the world economy. His name's Richard Duncan. He is the editor of a fantastic newsletter, a uh, video newsletter called Macro Watch, which we'll get into in a little bit. But Richard, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Buck. It's great to speak with you again. Yeah, it's funny. Every time we get you back on, it's it ends up being just, uh, you know, a few months, but then it seems like we're, you know, the world is moving at such a ridiculous, volatile pace, and it's, you know, completely different things to talk about. Well, that's right. I, I think the last time was about seven months ago. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I'd be wrong, but uh, that's, what, that's what I saw on my calendar. Yep, yep, and that that would be in a few decades ago. That would have been probably the equivalent of you know three or four years later, but but not uh, not these days. So you know, I've been watching you, I've been listening to you lately, and I know one of the things that you've been talking about is this you know liquid tsunami. Tell us about what exactly is the liquid tsunami. Okay, well, so. It was just about seven months ago when I published a macro watch video called Liquidity Tsunami May Drive Asset Prices Much Higher. So what that was all about was, of course, the Fed at that time was creating $120 billion a month, as it still is. And it was expected to continue doing that uh, well into the future. So that alone, would that's an enormous amount of money going into the economy every month. Yeah. Multiply that by 12 months, and that's $1.44 trillion of new money going into the economy per year if yeah. it had lasted for a full year. And then on top of that, the Treasury Department had built up this huge stockpile of cash in its bank account at the Fed, which is called the Treasury General Account. And right. The money was just there, parked there, not doing anything, but they were projecting that they were going to run that cash down right. by spending it. And as they spent that money, uh, I don't, something like approaching a trillion, at the peak, the, they had $1.8 trillion in that account. That was in the middle of last year. And, and they were projecting they were going to run that down. Uh, so this combination of the Treasury spending all its cash hoard, injecting money into the economy, and the Fed injecting $120 billion a month into the economy, looked like it was just going to flood the financial markets with liquidity with the potential of driving asset prices much higher. And so since then, that's pretty much what we've seen. Right. Uh, um, up until a few days ago, anyway, between that March video and just a few days ago, the S&P 500 was up 16% in that seven-month period. And property prices are up, uh, home prices are up 20% year on year. The only thing that's really disappointed has been gold. Gold only went up 3% during the, that seven months. Yep. So the financial markets were pretty much on fire. Now, now, however, things look like they're about to change. This liquidity tsunami is about to come to an abrupt end, it appears. And that was the name of my last video. So tell us why. Why is that, you know, obviously um, liquidity tsunami along with very low interest rates has uh, definitely, you know, played a significant role in, in driving up asset prices. But tell us a little bit more about what goes into the end of the liquidity tsunami. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago at the Fed's last FOMC meeting, they made it pretty clear that they intend to start tapering quantitative easing. Uh, either in November or December. And furthermore, they intend to bring this whole quantitative easing thing to a close by the middle of next year. So that's a little bit sooner than people had expected, than the markets had expected. Generally, the people, the markets had anticipated the Fed would start tapering in January, and the, the tapering process would go on pretty much all year long and in sometime near the end of the year. But so what we're seeing is sooner and more aggressive tapering. So that means that the Fed will end up creating less money than the markets had been expecting. So depending on whether they start in November or December, and assuming that they 
reduce the size of quantitative easing every month by about $15 billion a month. That means they're going to create something like between $550 billion and $650 billion between now and the middle of next year. That's less than had been expected. And so that will bring, at that point, then quantitative easing will come to an end and the Fed will stop increasing, stop cre- creating money on a, a significant scale altogether. So the tapering is happening faster and more aggressively than had been expected. And now on top of that, the Treasury Department has run down its cash hoard. I mentioned it peaked last year at $1.8 trillion. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, now it's below $200 billion. Mm. But what they're telling us now is that they intend to increase that to $800 billion by the end of the year. And by increasing the cash that they keep at the Fed, that will take roughly $600 billion out of the economy, and it will just simply be parked in the Treasury Department's bank account at the Fed. So that could end up being, if they actually do that, that will take out $600 billion from the financial markets. That will be more than the Fed injects during the next three months. Right. So that's actually, so instead of the markets being flooded with liquidity from the Fed and the Treasury, what we're going to see actually is the beginning of a liquidity drain where liquidity is withdrawn from the financial markets. And so that's going to create an entirely different and much more difficult economic environment than right. we than the financial markets have grown accustomed to. Right. Um, We've been inundated with liquidity. Asset prices have been on fire. Speculative stocks have been going to the moon. Uh, and now all that's likely to come to an end. And the problem is, so, okay, there'll still be a lot of liquidity, but the main force that had been pushing asset prices higher was this ongoing month after month surge in liquidity. That was the main driver of asset prices, and that's now going to stop. And the problem is asset prices are now so expensive that they're really vulnerable to a significant correction. One question for you on the you know tapering of Fed's uh, quantitative easing. That results in a um, you know, a side effect of higher um, interest rates too, doesn't it? Well, so that will depend on the supply and the demand for new government bonds. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the main reasons that the Fed, perhaps the main reason the Fed is, is going to taper aggressively is that the government is going to be borrowing much less money mm-hmm. than it has in the recent past. For example, in the fiscal year, the government's fiscal year ends at the end of September. So in fiscal year 2020, the government borrowed, the budget deficit was $3.1 trillion. In the fiscal year that just ended a few days ago, the budget deficit projected to be around $3 trillion again. But for the next fiscal year, ending September 30th, 2022, in other words, this year that we're currently in, the budget deficit is expected to be only just about $1.1 trillion. So rather than the government having to borrow $3 trillion plus to fund its budget deficit, as it has over the last couple of years, this year, it will only be borrowing $1 trillion. Mm-hmm. So if the Fed continued with quantitative easing at the rate of $120 billion a month, or $1.44 trillion a year, the Fed would end up creating more money and buying more government bonds than the government actually sold in this upcoming year. In fact, about $300 billion more, mm-hmm. a thir- roughly 30% more. So if the Fed actually created more money and bought more government bonds than the government sold, that would mean the demand for bonds from the Fed and other sources would be much greater than the supply. So that would push up bond prices. Which, and when bond prices go up, the bond yields go down. Right. So that could have re- resulted in bond yields fall. The 10-year government bond yield now is roughly about 1.5%. That sort of dynamic could have pushed the bond yield back below 1% Hmm. and driving this extraordinary mania in the financial markets to even greater heights and and creating greater bubbles than we already have. And the Fed doesn't want that. So I think that's the main reason they've decided to taper 
sooner and more aggressively because if they don't the financial yeah. market bubbles are just going to run completely out of control and destabilize the economy when they eventually pop yeah you know the the thing is it's interesting to me is to try to understand like you know i mean the trajectory you describe makes uh makes sense but then you look at the behavior of the fed over the last several years where if there's any appearance of anything you know headed uh, south, you know, the economy starting to, you know, look a little bit um, shaky. They they seem to reverse their course pretty quickly. You well, know, that's right. If there's any major sell off in the stock market, they make some sort of statement to, to reassure the stock market and take action if if necessary. So but that's not their problem at the moment. At the at the right. moment. Uh, of course, the GDP has been growing very rapidly, mm -hmm. and the asset prices have been inflating very rapidly. Right. So the thing is, the Fed has to move in slow motion. They have to signal what they're going to do well in advance so they don't frighten anyone. They usually can't turn their policy too quickly, but they can make statements suggesting that they may turn their policy if necessary, and that usually is enough to encourage the stock market to stop dropping. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and, and again, well, I guess it is to be seen is actually how much they're going to tolerate. And so, you know, they may sort of talk a big game, but that if things really start heading South, who knows, we'll have to see. They just, it doesn't seem like they're necessarily, you know, stuck to a strategy in any sort of way. You know, that's right. They do have the option to change their mind. Right. And, and again, one more yeah. point on this yeah. while we're here is the asset prices really are incredibly inflated. Mm -hmm. There is one indicator that I look at all the time that I call the wealth to income ratio. Right. Wealth to income. And what that actually is, is the, the net worth of all the Americans, all their assets minus all their debt, their net worth, in other words, their wealth, divided by disposable personal income. In other words, income. So it's wealth divided by income. Mm -hmm. and the, the Fed provides this ratio going back to 1950. And the average for this ratio has been about 550%. But during the NASDAQ bubble in 2000, it went up to 615%, uh, which was well above the average. And then, of course, that bubble popped. And then this ratio went back down to its average. Mm-hmm. And in the property bubble, it went up to 670%, which was the highest it had ever been by far, 670. And then we know what happened then. That bubble popped, and this ratio went back to its average. Well, now this ratio, and keep in mind, the previous peak was 670. Right now, it's 790. So it's completely off the charts. Yeah. Uh, and if history is any guide, these big peaks are followed by very big crashes. So, okay, it's true there's a lot of liquidity. It's true interest rates are very close to zero. Uh, but as liquidity starts to tighten up and as any threat of higher interest rates begins to emerge, asset prices are really very exposed and vulnerable and could experience another sharp crash. So, you know, you said something again, you know, if history is a guide. Is history a guide anymore? <laughs> I mean, you know, it just seems to me like if, you know, if if you if you put Fed policies, you know, back when a number of these other times that you talked about, I just wonder, you know, would they have behaved differently back then? Would they have, you know, the way they behave now versus back then? I, I, I'm just curious. Historic, that is, that's a good point. That's you know, a good point. I mean, they certainly try to, they would try to prevent the stock market right. from crashing. Right. 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 You know, when the crisis of 2008 hit, that was the property bubble, the uh -huh. previous peak in this ratio. Right. right. Uh, the credit started contracting and they responded pretty aggressively with this new policy, really quite mm -hmm. new policy of quantitative easing on a truly extraordinary scale. Right. And that, that did manage to eventually reflate the bubble, but not quickly enough. Um, when the pandemic started and the economy started crashing, 
that this time they injected even more liquidity and, and very fast. And so the economy took a very big swoon and then recovered almost immediately. And, and the stock markets have doubled since their lows in February or March 2020. So, yes, they would respond. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't mean, though, that we won't see a big sure. dip, dip before they do. So I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the inflation that we see. Now, the government insists it's transitory. What do you think about that? Okay, well, so, yes, let's talk about uh, inflation. I'm in the transitory camp, and here's the reason why. So after the crisis of 2008, seems like a long time ago, the Fed responded with quantitative easing, three big rounds of quantitative easing. And no one had seen anything like that. There had never been anything like that. And everyone had been taught that massive amounts of fiat money creation by the central bank would inevitably lead to very high rates of inflation. And for the first couple of years after QE started, it looked like that was going to be true. The inflation rate did start moving higher and food prices went much higher. And by 2011, we had, uh, you'll remember in North Africa, we had what is known as the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. Food prices went up a lot. Some food vendor couldn't feed his family. He set himself on fire, and this sort of sparked off a a revolution across North Africa that toppled a number of governments. Mm -hmm. And so it really looked like that this horrible consequence that we'd been told to expect would play out, that there would be very high rates of inflation. And that's what I believed up through 2011. Inflation peaked then, I think, around 3.8% year on year. This is probably core CPI, I guess. But it peaked in 2011. And then what happened? The high food prices resulted in the following year, farmers planted a whole lot of more crops and food prices came back down. And globalization continued to exert strong downward pressure on the cost of manufactured goods. And by 2015, we had deflation again. So despite this extraordinary surge in money creation, I mean, the the Fed's total assets increased by five times between 2008 and 2014. That should have set off hyperinflation, if if you believe what we were taught in the economic textbooks at university, but it didn't. So it didn't happen last time. I don't see why it is likely to happen this time. And in in fact, what we're seeing is... uh, uh, Nothing like what you would ex- expect. The Fed has created, I think, something close to $4.2, $4.3 trillion. It's more than doubled the amount of money that it creates in, since March in 2020. So in a very short period of time, it's created more than $4 trillion dollars. And, and on top of that, the Fed, uh, sorry, the government hit the economy with massive fiscal stimulus, three big rounds, uh, the CARES Act in March 2020, $2 trillion, and then $900 billion more in December 2020, and then in March 2021, another $1.9 trillion. So government debt increased by $5 trillion between February 2020 and the middle of this year. And the Fed created $4 trillion to help finance that debt. So the Fed effectively financed 80% of this increase in the government debt that the government borrowed in order to stimulate the economy. And so that is a recipe for disaster if you believe what the economic textbooks tell us to believe. Right. But actually, what what have we experienced, in fact? Well, so... The, CP, the core CPI is up, this is core CPI, year on year, it's up 4%. But, of course, this is, this is an index. So there's an actual index level. The index is 4% higher than it was 12 months ago. But if you look back two years, it's up only, it's up less than 6%. Mm-hmm. So the two-year average is just 2.9%. So inflation has been 2.9% on average for the last two years. That's hardly hyperinflation. So there's some sort of base effect that you have to consider. 
So it's important to look at the month-on-month change yeah. in the inflation numbers. And if you look at the month-on-month change, in other words, how much prices go up each month for core CPI. So back in March of this year, the prices were going up. Well, so in February, the prices went up 0.1%. In March, they went up 0.3%. Then in April, after the big stimulus package, in April, they jumped up 0.9%. In May, they were up 0.7%. In June, they were up 0.9%. But after June, they started falling. In July, prices were only up 0.3%. And in August, they were up 0.1% again. So the average monthly increase during this century, from the year 2000 until August 2021, the average monthly increase has been 0.2%. So last month, they were actually up less than the average for the century. And so we're already seeing the inflationary pressures abate. And, of course, there are a lot of issues. We have the semiconductor shortage. Uh, We have shipping shortages. We now have energy prices going higher, in part because of the hurricane. We've had some droughts in Brazil that have caused... Food, some food prices to go higher, or food, coffee, sugar, things like that. But despite that, what we're seeing at the core level is that the inflationary pressures have already started to abate. And one of the main reasons for that is semiconductors. When the pandemic started, the automobile companies expected demand to be very weak for cars. And so they canceled their semiconductor orders. And by the time they realized that all the fiscal stimulus was going to result in a lot of demand for cars, it was too late to reorder the semiconductors. Mm-hmm. The s- semiconductor manufacturers had sold them to someone else. And so this caused a backlog for semiconductors. And so there's this now a shortage of new cars. Mm-hmm. And, and consequently, the price of used cars shot up. So in April, used car prices went up 10% that one month alone. Mm-hmm. In May, they went up another 7%. In June, they went up another 10%. So during those three months, the increase in used car prices alone accounted for one-third of the increase in inflation. And what's changed is over the last couple of months, last month in August, used car prices went down 1%. And so without that, that was one of the main drivers of this higher level of inflation. Without that, that's the reason that the inflation rate was much lower. But still, used car prices are up 32% compared with one year ago. That's not going to last when semiconductors are not going to be in shortage forever. And when the supply returns and there'll be plenty of new cars again and used car prices will probably fall by 32%. Right. And just as the increase in used car prices drove up inflation during April, May, and June, at some point over the next year, we're going to see the opposite effect. They're going to drop by 10% a month and that's going to be a drag on inflation. And so these domestic bottlenecks or these international global bottlenecks that we're experiencing and shortages and supply disruptions, they're not going to last. These supply disruptions are going to be overcome as they always are. And on the other side of the equation, this extraordinary demand that has been created by the massive fiscal stimulus, the three big rounds of fiscal stimulus, that's not going to be repeated. There aren't going to be, there's not going to be another trillion dollar stimulus package where people open up their mailbox and get $1,400 checks. Right. That's not going to happen anymore. That demand has already hit the economy and it is fading out already. So the demand side is going to weaken. The supply side is going to uh, recover and we're going to be back in more or less the kind of situation we were before the pandemic hit with global excess capacity of labor and industrial capacity and great deflationary pressure, disinflationary pressures again, with the Fed struggling to hit its 2% inflation target. So, um, yeah, I want to shift again uh, to something that seems to be a, uh, I guess is a little unclear how it's going to affect the world economy. But if you want to talk a little bit about, if you would, uh, maybe just kind of get people caught up on this whole China Evergrande uh, issue. What exactly is China Evergrande and why is this of significant potentially to us in the U.S.? 
So China Evergrande is either the biggest Chinese property company or one of the very largest, and it is effectively bankrupt. Do they own property only in China or in the U.S. as well? No, they own property. They may have some investments outside of China, but most of all of their assets are in China. Mm-hmm. You see these videos now going for back for years where they're, you see these Chinese ghost towns yep. where there are complete cities where no one lives. Well, Evergrande built some of them. Okay. And Evergrande has something like $300 billion worth of debt, and they are now in trouble because the Chinese government has decided for some reason that's not entirely clear that they're not going to allow them to continue rolling over their debt as they always have in the past. Now, China's economy has been a bubble for decades. There has been massive excess supply of property and property inflation going back. You know, I've lived in Asia since 1986 most of the time. And one of the big experiences in my career was watching the Asia crisis in 1997, when Thailand's economy crashed, Malaysia's economy crashed, South Korea's economy crashed. And I thought China would as well. It was the bubble, just like these other economies were at that point, but it didn't. The Chinese authorities managed to control their bubble and just keep it growing. And and so I've expected China's economy to have a crisis for decades. And But in China, when you're the government and you control the central banks and you control all the commercial banks and you effectively control all the corporations, nobody can go bankrupt as long as you continue to instruct the banks to lend them enough new money this year to allow them to pay interest on all the money they borrowed in earlier years. Who's, de- who's, so, who's carrying the debt? Who's, I mean, are these Chinese banks? Chinese banks, but there are also a lot of Evergrande bonds that have been sold internationally, denominated in dollars. Mm. So there are foreign holders of this debt as well. Are those, uh, is that typically countries that are buying up a lot of this stuff? I mean, who who's buying those bonds? I guess I'm no, trying to figure out what the, the exposure is, right, to, to the rest of the world. Um, it would be... You know, like all the people around the world who owned uh, asset-backed securities when Uh the property bubble of 2008 blew up. You know, they were here, there, and everywhere. Pension funds in Germany. To the same Um, degree uh, as... as, um, You never know until the whole thing ends, but probably not to the same degree, but spread out to the same same extent. But Mm. the amounts involved are probably not as large. Right. Internationally. So how big of a problem is this uh, for us, do you think? Or is this one of those things that we'll just have to wait and see at this point? Well, obviously, we'll have to wait and see. But wh- what do you think? So big changes are happening in China now. There are, of course, the ongoing trade tensions between the U.S. and China and growing political tensions verging on Cold War. And now, at this time, China's government, the president, Xi Jinping, has decided to crack down on the tech companies and education companies. And effectively, the Communist Party is exerting even greater control over the entire economy than ever before. And at this time, they have made the decision not to roll over Evergrande's debts, not to give them more financing. Mm -hmm. So they are squeezing the property sector. And the property sector has accounted for about a third of all China's economic growth, or about a third of China's economy is entirely driven by property. So this, the real danger for the rest of the world is not so much that the rest of the world is holding so much Chinese Evergrande debt that if it defaults, it's going to cause a fiscal, systemic financial sector crisis in the, in the West. The real threat is that China's economy is going to slow down very significantly because its main driver was property. And now there's just so much excess capacity, property capacity, and the authorities are trying to crack down on it. Where's the growth going to come from? If they stop building, that's amazing. When you fly over China, you look down and you see thousands of skyscrapers, thousands of Mm -hmm. housing, 30, 40, 50 story residential buildings in blocks 
is just extraordinary to see. And that you can imagine how much cement and steel and concrete sure, and, sure. and machine, machinery and workers, all that required to build. If they stop building that now, that's going and copper, for instance, you can imagine the sort of impact that would have on global demand for all of those products. So China really, the U.S. was the main driver of global growth for decades up until about 2008, as it ran very large trade deficits with the rest of the world. And that allowed the rest of the world to produce much more than it could have otherwise done. But after 2008, China really took over as the growth driver for the world by buying so many commodities and also through their Belt and Road project, where they have taken their excess cement and steel and sold it to African countries to allow their steel companies to continue manufacturing steel and keeping people employed. But now China as a global growth driver looks like that is going to slow substantially, which means that the global economy uh, is likely to weaken economic growth globally. Right, right. So you see it less as a, you know, as a, a Lehman Brothers and more as a type of situation where, you know, slowing down of the world's fastest growing economy sends ripple effects throughout the rest of the world, basically because China's demand for things goes way down. Yes, I, I think in China, they, the authorities are not going to let things run completely out of control. Yeah, uh, They're not going to let all the property companies start going bankrupt. They're not going to let a lot of banks go bankrupt. Yeah, uh, The bank can't go bankrupt until the government says it's bankrupt. And if China wants to keep its banks solvent, the central bank can just create money and give it to them and they'll be solvent. Right. So it's unlikely that this is going to be a near-term financial sector implosion of China. That would be very surprising. But it does look like that the economy could start slowing significantly. It's much slower economic growth, which will be a, a drag on global economic growth yeah. and commodity prices, and therefore leading to less inflationary pressures. And then circularly back to the Fed, probably going back to its previous yeah. policies. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's just a circular thing. Right. So so I think the, yeah. the big lesson that everyone needs to learn yeah. is that in the 21st century, in this age where we stopped backing money with gold 50 years ago, yeah. the, thing, the thing that drives economic growth today is credit growth. Right. Credit growth drives economic growth. In the U.S., Going back to 1950, any time credit grew by less than 2% adjusted for inflation, the U.S. went into recession. And the recession didn't end until there was another big surge of credit growth. So what we've just experienced in the U.S. was a very big surge of total credit growth because the government borrowed $5 trillion sure. in a year and a half and pumped it into the economy. And so that's given us the economic boom that such as it is, 6% GDP growth last quarter, for instance. But now looking ahead, since the government's not going to keep borrowing $5 trillion every year, uh, the credit growth is going to slow again. And we're going to move back down to something closer to 3% credit growth instead of 9% credit growth, which is what we had in 2020. And as credit growth slows again, the economy is going to slow again. Credit growth drives economic growth, and we're moving back into a period where credit growth is going to be weaker, it appears. And that will certainly be the case if the Fed does begin to increase interest rates. If it gets very far along in hiking the federal funds rate, which they're now talking about hiking beginning sometime at the end of next year, if the interest rates go up, and that's going to make it even more difficult for the private sector to borrow and spend. So I think the economy could be considerably weaker in 2022 and 2023 than the general consensus currently holds. Sure. Well, uh, I guess we'll we'll have to we'll have to see. And I bet uh, the next time we have you on, it'll be uh, hopefully it'll start to declare itself a little bit more. I feel like the 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 lack of really uh, 
feeling like anything's predictable is one of the hardest things for investors out there, you know? Well, that's right. And everything does change and so often in unexpected ways. Of course, one of the biggest threats is still quite unlikely, but a possibility is that the current Cold War with, between the U.S. and China turns hot. Hmm. The Chinese are now flying fighter jets over Taiwan practically every day. And if somebody makes a mistake, people could start dying. Yeah. And if that happens, who knows what will happen, but it won't be pleasant. Right. If it, if it gets out of control, because if there is a, any sort of significant shooting war with China, then all bets are off. Right. All this that I've said about the deflationary pressures of globalization would immediately disappear. And all of the things that we've been buying from China would certainly cost a whole lot more. Sure. Practically overnight, meeting the very high rates of inflation. But again, I still view that as, as very unlikely, but still just discussing things, unexpected things that can go wrong. There are always plenty of them. Richard, always, uh, always uh, very interesting to talk to you. Uh, if people want to learn more, uh, I would highly recommend to subscribe to uh, Richard's um, Macro Watch. Will you tell us a little bit about that and where we can uh, subscribe, Richard? Thanks, Mike. So, yes, people can find Macro Watch on my website, which is richardduncaneconomics.com. That's richardduncaneconomics.com. The Macro Watch is a video newsletter which I started eight years ago this month. And every two weeks or so, I upload a new PowerPoint presentation uh, in which I discuss, uh, there's audio and there's the PowerPoint presentation. I discuss some important development in the global economy and how that's likely to impact asset prices. I mean, for instance, today we've been talking about the liquidity tsunami and now the end of the liquidity tsunami. Those are the sorts of videos that I produce. And there are now roughly 75 hours of these macro watch videos in the archives. So anyone who subscribes will get a new video every couple of weeks and also have immediate access to all of these videos in the archives covering almost every important subject in macroeconomics that you could ever want to know about. So I hope your listeners will take a look at uh, richardduncaneconomics.com if they would like to subscribe, I'd like to offer them a 50% subscription discount. If they hit the subscribe button, they'll be prompted to put in a discount coupon code. They can subscribe at a 50% discount. So I hope they'll take a look. Absolutely. I So I am a subscriber myself. Highly recommend it. You know, it's a, especially for a lot of uh, you high paid professionals who never took macroeconomics. Uh, and for those who did, it's I mean, obviously, it's a, it's just a it's good to know what's going on out there. It helps you be an educated investor and make some decisions uh, based on, um, you know, more than your gut. So, um, Richard. I want to thank you again for being on Wealth Formula Podcast, and hopefully we will catch up with you in a few months and see how things turn out. Great, Buck. Thank you. I look forward to the next time.